Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise and thank God for this opportunity He has given me to stand before you one more time. And uh, I trust that God has kept all of us safe under the shadow of His wings, as His promises are. I'm going to get right into it. Um, as you know, that we've started a new series. It's called The New and Living Way. Uh, went away from our um, pattern of covering one book. We have gone to a topical format for those of you who missed the last two sermons. And we're going to cover a series of topics under this overall title called The New and Living Way. Um, and uh, if you'll just put up the next slide, I will kind of just recap real quick. So as um, Minu started off the series that covered uh, the fact that um, all of humanity was depraved and separated from God through, the, through sin, right, and was headed for condemnation, just like this picture shows, um, is the bottom half of the earth, uh, was head for uh, destruction and condemnation, uh, but God in his mercy uh, gave us a new covenant, which um, Justin talked about last time. He talked about how um, there were different covenants that God made with people throughout uh, biblical history, uh, whether it was Noah or Moses, uh, Abraham, Moses, David, and then finally he gave a new covenant. Um, and a covenant, if somebody remembers, does anybody remember what a covenant is? Anyone? I can't hear you. Justin? <laughs> um, so a covenant is an irrevocable promise, right? A, some, an unbreakable pact or agreement between two parties. And the problem with all the old covenants, as Justin said last time, was that God kept his side, but man kept failing on their side. You might have one, the, per, the original person kept it throughout their life, but, or even they stumbled, all of them stumbled throughout their life. But eventually, after multiple generations came after them, uh, people fell away. There was no solution for people to keep this covenant with God. Because it was impossible for, God, for man in his fallen state to be joined with the purpose and the ways of God uh, generation after generation or people to, to completely fall into or be faithful to the covenant of God, right? And so the new covenant said what? I will put my spirit inside of him. I will give him a new heart. I will put my word in him. And it is God living in man is the new covenant, right? Jeremiah uh, 32, 31 says that's what the promise is. What Christ made a way for is this new covenant. And under this covenant, when we choose to follow Christ in this new covenant, we are saying we are forming this irrevocable bond with him that will uh, survive our life on earth and then continue into eternity, which is our life after earth, right? So that is the new covenant. Uh, but before you can think about that, we have to really understand how you can join into this new covenant, right? What happens just a person who is naturally born, um, you know, how does he or she become part of this new covenant, right? In the other covenants, uh, you know, you had the founders of those, right, Noah or Abraham, you had, you know, these covenants tied to a certain person, and people who came after them were joined to that, right? It, that is not the case now. This covenant is not tied to any one person other than the person of Jesus Christ, right? So we, we are making this covenant with God through Christ, and and it is open to everybody who chooses to follow Christ in this covenant, right? So I'm going to illustrate this. Uh, there's a lot of points I want to cover today. So, but I'm going to start off an illustration through the story of uh, Nicodemus, which you can find in John chapter 3. So I want to just read a few verses, if you'll follow along with me. John chapter 3, uh, first few uh, verses. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews, 
the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, and no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind blows where it listed, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it comes or whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? So, Okay, so a little bit of context. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was part of the religious establishment at the time, right? He was one of them. The rulers who en masse had opposed Christ so far. So the Pharisees and the religious leaders there and the Jews who followed them opposed Christ as the Messiah. They rejected him because he was saying things that was bringing their uh, sins to light. He exposed their hypocrisy, but he also confirmed that he was from God through the miraculous things that he did they had never seen before. Right? Uh, if you remember, it had been 400 years since the last Old Testament book had been written, and it was complete uh, silence from God uh, to a man, right? So this religious system had come, come up on the basis of the Old Testament scripture until that point, but people were using this false system not in the way God intended, right? They were using the Old Covenant, but in a false way with hypocrisy, and they were, when Christ came, he really shattered and shook up that system, and, and people could not resist his words, could not believe his miracles, but they knew that if this were to continue, they could not continue in their old way of life. You all with me? So, so, but Nicodemus was not one of them. I mean, he was one of them, but he was not of the same mind. So sometimes when we think about Nicodemus, we tend to think of him like, oh, wow, what a fool. Does he not get this? Or we think of him like, how can he not get this? Now think about this. Nobody had ever heard this truth that Christ just told Nicodemus. I actually see Nicodemus and see that Christ loved him so much and saw him and uh, appreciated and responded to his desire. He came at night so that nobody would know, right? And he came and sought him out. And he said he wasn't trying to test Christ like the other Pharisees, right? He, he came to him and he was like, you can't be an ordinary person by doing these miracles. You have to be somebody that is sent from God. So he came to him with a true desire to know Christ, right? So I believe God loved him, or Jesus loved him in that moment, even though when we read it, it seems like judgment or rebuke. I believe that Christ brought the truth and the mystery of the gospel of God to Nicodemus in his love for him. It seems harsh because it really clashed with his understanding of God's kingdom, right? So, so this is not my topic, so I wanna keep moving fast. So, but he, think about what he said. Except a man be born again. This is a completely foreign concept to Nicodemus or anybody who didn't even grow up in church and never heard any christian language, right? or at people of that time. What do you mean born again? What does that mean? Like I can't even wrap my brain around these words you're saying. He actually said, 
okay, I want to be part of the kingdom of God. You're saying I can't be part of the kingdom of God. I am a teacher of the law who I thought until this moment is part of the kingdom of God. Are you telling me I'm believing a lie? And you're saying, not only that, I have to be born again. Do I have to go back to my mother's belly again and come back out? What kind of, what kind of uh, teaching is this? So that's when Jesus said, no, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he will not see the kingdom of God. Now this is the mystery behind those two words, the born again part. So, but think about this, just quick illustration. So when your kids, some of your kids might have brought, I think it's about 500 bucks, this um, a car or Jeep looks like a real Hummer or a Cadillac or a Porsche or whatever. You can go buy it at Toys R Us or used to be Toys R Us, right? They, they drive around when they're a little kid. It doesn't go quite 60 miles an hour. It might get to two miles an hour or one, right? It, you know, it's battery powered or whatever. But when they grow up and they turn 16, when they get their license, do, do your kids ever can want to continue to drive that little toy car? They want the real thing, right? Yes? yes? This is exactly what happened with Nicodemus. He had been driving this toy car, the shadow, a model, a replica of things to come. The Old Testament laws and all these things were given pointing to Christ. There's this big arrow, like in those old cartoons, right? This big arrow pointing above uh, this character in history. And it, it'd been, it'd been this, he's been driving this toy car all this time. And then when he was met with a real one, his mind was blown away. He was like, wow, I want to believe, but I don't know. I've only known this toy car so far. What is this new covenant? You want me to be born again? This is the difference between the old religious system and the new covenant. Is we have to move on from following Christ through our own way. Right? Through obeying laws with our own way to this new and living way under this new covenant. But that involves a new birth. We have to be transformed from who we were to this new creature. Right? And to be born again, as Christ said, of the word and of the spirit. Okay, so I got to provide a little context here. So uh, I need to explain this. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide. Oh, it's a little small. Okay, so there's three concentric circles there. What happened in the beginning? So God made Adam in the image of God. He was perfect, meaning there was no sin in him. There was perfect fellowship and communion with God. Okay? And he was made in three, but as one. Meaning the yellow circle is his spirit. The blue, light blue circle is his soul, which consists of, you can't see it, uh, which is mind, emotions, and your will, right? And then the outward green circle is the body. So every human being consists of these three parts, the spirit, soul, and body, yes? yes. Um, so when Adam was made in the image of God, he had perfect communion with God. He had perfect fellowship with God before he was separated from him, and his spirit communed with God. Because it says, what, in John 4, 24, God is a spirit. And fellowship with God requires our connection with him through our spirit. Okay, so if you click forward, oh, there's a second image. So when Adam sinned, his spirit broke off the communion with God. He lost connection with God. But he continued to exist, you know, with his mind, so mind, emotion, will, his, which is his soul, and his body, right? So when he lost connection with God, now he is living, what? On the basis of his soul, which is what? His mind, emotion, and will. That means whatever it kept saying again and again in the Bible, what? Uh, the, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And he was, went further and further and further away from God. Went 
uh, and so that's why it says in Romans chapter 5, what? Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Meaning people went further away from God into condemnation and death and sin just exploded because what? Man lost his connection with God. Now he is acting on the basis of what he wants to do. What seemed good to him. This was the sin that the devil was trying to get him to do, right? If you eat of the fruit, you will know between right and wrong. You can choose your way. You can be like God. You all with me? This is what happened when he got separated from God. His, he was driven by his soul, which was what was what? Our embedded selfish nature, right? Within us is our selfish nature. We, uh, is we only want to do what is good for us, right? We try to do what is good for others, but most of the time we fail because what? We do what we want to do, yes? Can anybody here, even if they lock you up in prison for decades, force you to do something you don't want to do? In your mind, like in your mind, you might do it outwardly, right? You might obey somebody. Even if we're tortured, we cannot be forced into something in our mind to do something we don't want to do, right? So when, God, when man lost his connection with God, he continued in sin. And it got so bad in the time of Noah, and God was like, everybody is doing only sin. It says, what? The thought of every, uh, uh, every thought in man's heart was evil. And all his imagination was evil. He only wanted to do sin. So he brought the flood and judgment and destroyed all of the then known world, except for Noah and his family. It was again a shadow of things to come, right? You can only be saved by... A, trusting in the ark which is Christ's redemption from the water which is a judgment right if you're not in the ark you, you're not uh, you're not part of the kingdom of God but one thing to note there it's not that God did not have to bring the ark you all with me God did not have to bring the ark God could have destroyed them because of their sin, because he's a holy God who cannot be where sin is, right? God didn't have to bring the ark, but in his mercy, he made a way for anybody who choose to accept his way could enter into the ark and be saved. Yes? The same way when God saw that man, if he continued in this path, there was all of creation would be lost. I would lose the, my sons and daughters that I made in my own image. He didn't offer this path to the angels that rebelled. Because the angels were not made in the same way that human beings were in the image of God. Okay? He didn't offer the devil and his angels a path back to redemption. He only offered that to mankind. You all with me? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, enter into this ark that is Christ, might have everlasting life. So you might not perish in the flood. You all with me? But the next verse is even more important. This is still John speaking to him. It said that what? He that believes in him is not condemned. He that believes not is condemned already. It's not that we are privileged to have this grace. It's that we were already condemned. It's like the people of the world at the time of Noah. You're already condemned. You're headed for destruction. You can save yourself by entering into this ark. You all with me? But Christ made this way. So I've got to keep moving forward. So, um, so when, when that happened, um, uh, can you go to the next slide? Uh, so what happened, so John really lays this out very clearly. We are born of the water. How to be born of the water and born of the spirit. So if you go back to John chapter 1. Um, he explains this very well. As many as received him. To them he gave power to be the sons of God. To them that believe in his name. So just like in the example of Noah. If you choose to enter into this ark. If you choose to believe there is a rain 
coming that you've never seen before because it never rained there before. If, there, if you choose that, if you continue in the way you're going, you're headed for judgment and enter into this ark and choose to obey the way that God has made out for you, you can have the power to become the sons of God. Just like after Noah, the whole world was filled with what? The descendants of Noah, the one who believed, right? The same way we and our families and the people we bring to Christ after us can be part of the kingdom of God if we, we and our family choose to what? Trust in this ark that is Christ. So that is first, receive him. And then we can become the, have the power and believe in him. Uh, I just want to dwell on a second therefore on belief. The belief there is not talking about, you know, historical knowledge. It's not talking about, oh, I know that Christ existed. It's a complete submission to this way that God is offering. Because even Nicodemus believed that there was a Messiah. But unless Nicodemus chose to give his life to Christ, which we know that he did, later did, he is not part of the kingdom of God. So being born again requires a belief that is more than just head knowledge. A belief is a, tra- a complete submission that, and admission uh, that you are, you are a sinful human being that is headed for this judgment and condemnation unless I enter into this ark. When we accept this fact, then we are born again, not of blood, not meaning not flesh and blood, not from any man's ways, not of the will of the flesh, that you can't will yourself it to be born again. You can't force this to happen unless you first receive Christ, give your life to him, and then it's a not of the will of flesh or not of the will of man. Nobody, not your parents, your relatives, not your closest confidants can help you be born again. Go through this new birth experience, but of God, only God. When you choose to receive him, when you choose to enter into this ark, God uh, gives us his experience of being born again, of the water and of the spirit, and a moment on the water. So I know some of us understand this to be water baptism. And I will actually reject that notion that water baptism is the final step in the salvation experience. I believe the water here represents the word of God. The word of God transforms us, right? Our, our, our inner man makes alive our spirit because our faith in Christ. Because it says what washing of the water of the word uh, in, uh, in First uh, Peter chapter um, 123, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. We are born again by the word of God. That means when we hear the word of God, it births in us this faith that we need the saving faith, that we need to trust in his redemption. And then the final step is the water baptism, which is a public witness. That's why when you look at creation, the earth was what? In the water and outside of the water. There was water above and water on the earth. It shows the water of the word in us. And the water baptism is the public witness of being buried with him in, in death and made alive in resurrection. Okay, so water, born of water and of the spirit. So if you look at the creation account, um, you can see the multi-step process, right? This earth was without form and void. There was, it was shapeless, just like us. We were shapeless and without form and void when the spirit of the God moved upon the face of the waters. This water that was there, God moved. When this shapeless being that was us mo- received Christ, his spirit moved and inter- worked with the word that was we received and to make this new creation. Then the God made light and the light was birthed and the of Christ was formed in us, right? And he made a light to rule by day and, and a light, different light to rule by night. And then he brought forth fruits and all the trees and herbs yielding fruits. We brought all the fruit of the spirit with following through this creation account and we birthed uh, you know all the animals came forward which shows the people that we brought, brought to the kingdom of God and God told man what be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth but this started with 
the spirit moving upon the face of the earth. Yes? So this creation account represents the process that happens when we're born again. And then, um, I, need to, I need to keep going fast. <laughs> uh, so next slide, please. So, so what happens after we're saved? So this spirit, soul, body, same thing. Our spirit is now made alive, which is the yellow part, and grows stronger and stronger through obedience and submission to the Holy Spirit, which is now in us. You all with me? That's why Romans 12, 2 says what? Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then your, the blue part, which is a Christ-centered sancti- transformation and sanctification, which is our soul, which is our mind, our emotion, and our will, is now sanctified daily, transformed and changed into the nature of Christ through walking in obedience to His Word and through the Spirit. So it's not this one-time experience of receiving His Word and taking water baptism and you're set for life. No, this new birth sets us on this process and lifelong transformation and sanctification. That's what has to happen, and I'll invite the worship team to come forward. That's what has to happen after you're saved. And we'll talk more about this as we go through the series. But we were depraved through our sin. God made a new covenant with us. And he made a way for us to enter into this new covenant. Which is through the born again experience. Being born through the water and of the word. And through witnessing him in public. And through the spirit. And then now we're called to a life of transformation. And growth in sanctification. And uh, if you go to this final slide, just John, uh, so before God, sp- uh, Christ sp- uh, speaks to Nicodemus, he did his first miracle. Okay, so what happens there is, uh, we all know, right, there was a wedding, and they ran out of wine, and uh, they told Jesus who had come there, and they had probably heard that, uh, you know, he was somebody different, and there was somebody different about, about him, and Mary, his mother, came and said they're out of wine, and he instructed the servants to do certain things, right? And what did he say? He said, six water pots of stone, bring it. These were stone vessels. They were used for washing their hands and feet. People don't want anything to do with that. Because they uh, relate that to with what? <clears throat> um, things that you don't, you know, like you don't drink water out of, your, of that pot. It's a completely rejected vessel, just like us. We were outside the house of God, outside the commonwealth of Israel. But Jesus saw us and said, bring those pots inside the house. I have a use for him. I want to make new wine out of these pots. So they brought this stone vessel. The six vessels represents the number of man. It's mankind. It's six. These six vessels were brought inside. And he said, what? Fill it with water up to the brim. This is the word I was talking about. When we're full with the word of God. When our heart is filled and overflowed with the word that we receive and accept and choose to believe in. And they fill it to the brim. And then he said what? Serve this to the guests. And they served not water, but wine. Wine shows blood, which shows life. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. This life that is in us of Christ, God said, "What if uh, any uh, any man is in me? The rivers of life will flow out of his belly. Living water will flow out of his belly. This this water that's in us, the word that is in us, He intended for us to pour out and serve to others that need. Uh, this wine, this life transforming word that is given, brings life in the form of the wine." to people that receive it, and they go through the same process of being born in Christ. They go through the same process. They receive the word, and it gives them life. And that's why he told Adam, uh, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. We are not called to, you know, receive his word, uh, receive this born again experience, and just continue as it were. We're called to pour out this life and to others. Pour out this experience into others so that it may bring new life into those around us and that we may walk in the newness of life under the covenant 
led and transformed by His Spirit. May His name be glorified.